All right, all right. You guys could make your way back to your seats. Thank you for participating. I see people getting to know each other. Lots of people brand new at Beloved Church. It's always great to get to know others. I encourage you, we go to lunch every service after we go. You'll see a bunch of people hanging and corralling there. A good 30, 40 people normally go out to lunch. So if you want to go hang out, get to know some other people, uh, we can lead you and get you connected with that immediately after service. So once again, good to have you guys here. Just for the sake of doing it, we want to acknowledge uh, our live stream audience. We have people watching us from all over the country and the world, which is amazing. So we welcome you guys. I don't want to forget about you. You're real people there behind that computer. So we are so glad that you're tuning in today. Uh, but hey, we're going to jump right on in. I'm excited uh, for this Sunday. We're actually concluding our mini-series on building God's kingdom. Uh, By no means is it the end, because everything we talk about is always about the kingdom. But we are coming to the end of this mini-series, and Pastor Will, uh, our beloved Pastor Will, both by the way, he just turned 33 years old. Uh, But he just turned 33, but I have some sad news. Uh, Him and Andrea, the entire Chung family, they have caught COVID. They got COVID. I want you guys to know they're doing well under the circumstances, but, you know, fever, they are sick. But I'd say the the biggest uh, inconvenience is they have three children under the age of two. Uh, So they're they're raising their kids right now. And then Will got COVID. Now Andrea got COVID. So they send their love to you. But I say that because COVID is a major inconvenience, right? Those of us that have had that and they, they made it for like three years and it finally got them. But they send their love to you. But I say that because what do you do when the guy that's supposed to speak all of a sudden gets COVID and his entire family? We were lucky enough, one of our dear friends happened to be in town. He's speaking at some other things. He was here for a wedding. So he's had a very packed schedule. But we found out he was in town and then Will caught COVID. So in that moment, it was like, man, what do we do? And so we called the Audible, and we actually called in one of our dear friends who's actually going to guest speak for us today to conclude our mini-series on building the kingdom of God. So before I introduce him and before I set it up, um, he's a dear friend uh, to Will and Andrea and myself. Uh, I've actually known my boy Sammy now for like, I'd say it's probably a good decade, maybe, maybe even 12 years. I first met him on a campus, UC Berkeley, back in the day. Uh, that was 2011 or 12. So it's been a minute now, but he's a YWAMer. We have a lot of YWAMers in the building. YWAMers make some noise. This is your moment. We got a lot of YWAMers. If you don't know, you can look it up. But YWAMers, we got a lot of them here. He's a YWAMer. He's a missionary. Uh, I'll even go a little step further. Uh, in my opinion, he's one of the most unique leaders I've met. Uh, Next Gen Leaders. Uh, He's actually one of the founders of Circuit Riders. You would know the ministry, Circuit Riders, Collegiate Ministry, Campus Ministry. He started that with friends back in the day in 2007, 2008 on the Ivy Leagues, just seeing God move on these college campuses. He was doing that for years. He's done all sorts of ministry. I'm not just trying to blow him up, but to be honest, he is in high demand. He could pastor at certain churches. No, for real. He has. He could be pastoring at churches. He's doing missionary work. He's doing stadium events, which that's how I've worked with him a lot. I say that is he is a he is a gem in the body of Christ, and he's a dear dear friend. He's actually my golf mentor. We're gonna pray, We're gonna play this week a few times. We're gonna get that in. But if you guys could, can you do me a favor for both me and Will? Could you guys give him a beloved church welcome, our boy Sammy Rodriguez, as he brings the word of God. Take it away, bro. Like no pressure. Oh, my goodness. Oh, you do. You'll you'll be fine. Can we give it up for Pastor Jason? Come on, make some noise. I'm pretty sure Pastor Will and Andrea, Pastor Andrea are watching. Can we just say we love them on three, one, two, three? I think we could get a little bit louder. That was like we kind of love you. Like, well, we love you. I mean, it kind of. Let's get a little bit louder on three. One, two, three. Perfect. Um, I'm really excited. We are ending, this is, four, this is the fourth uh, a week or the fourth week for building God's kingdom, okay? So a little bit about me. Some of you guys might know me, many of you guys might not. Uh, my, I love sharing this so you understand my background. 
uh, Jason kind of dated me, even though I'm not that old, I'm 33, but I've been in ministry for like 75 years, it feels like, uh, before I was even born in heaven. But moving on from that, um, I'm, I'm, my dad's Latino, okay, so any Latinos in the room besides me? Okay, there's a few, all right, cool, 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 cool. Uh, mom's white, any white people in the room? Come on, somebody, come on, somebody, we got a few, okay, all right, there's some of the white people like, hey, guy, yeah, what's up? Um, and uh, I grew up around more minority uh, Latino and uh, black community, and uh, some of my best friends were Asian. So look at that. Look, I'm just the, the nations. Amen. Okay. So, um, but something you got to know about me is I am quite, uh, quite Pentecostal. Everyone say Pentecostal. So it just means that you get to talk back with me. If it's unfamiliar with you, that's totally fine. That's okay. I'm only here for a week. Okay. But like Jason said, Pastor Jason, I had an epic. Ser- series, sermon, prepared, going together. We're going to talk about the stories of the kingdom, the manifesto of the kingdom, and the keys of the kingdom. It was like four hours in. It's like 12, it's like midnight, 1 a.m., and then the Lord switches it up. Everyone say, switch up. So I'm going to preach on something else. If it's bad, we can blame Jason, okay? Does that sound good? So we're actually going to be talking a little bit more about being used by God, okay? And we're going to look in the Old Testament, and we're going to look at the life of Moses. Does that sound good? Here's what I want you to do is if you can, I want you to take some notes, either on your phone or in your handy-dandy notebook. I've heard this said before that goats take notes, okay? Goats Greatest of all time, take notes, okay? I've also heard that you have to take notes to get into heaven. That's not true. Okay, let's, let's keep going, okay? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to end this moment of building God's kingdom, and we want to look at a case study of this guy named Moses, okay? And we're going to look at a specific scripture, which was a pivotal moment in the life of the Israelites if they were going to either be completely taken out or go into the promised land without the presence of God. And what I want to do is I want to look and lean in on this moment, and I want to fill you in with a little history and a little background if you don't know it, okay? So Moses was raising up, if you don't know this, as the deliverer for the people of Israel. The people of Israel at this time were 400 years in slavery in Egypt, and Moses was raised up, actually raised in Egypt, had 40 years of preparation as a shepherd, sent back in, and then he actually said, as we've seen the prince of Egypt, who's seen the prince of Egypt? Come on, somebody, raise your hand high. If you haven't, you need to watch it today. Okay, great movie. Who's listened to the soundtrack? Anybody raise your hand? Okay, moving on. Okay, great songs. He said, let my people go, all right? He, uh, Pharaoh lets his people go, and then he's in, they're in the wilderness. They're getting ready to enter into the promised land. But Moses goes up on the mountain. He gets what we all know as the Ten Commandments. But during that time, while Moses lingered, what happened was the people of Israel, they got used to worshiping idols. Everyone say idols. They got used to worshiping idols. So the famous story, if you don't know, we don't have time to go into it, but the famous story is they build this golden calf. And, and God, at that moment, what happens is he's so frustrated and infuriated that he's getting ready to destroy the people of Israel and just start over. Because that's how much he hates idols. And I want to read this quote to you, and then we're going to jump into the scripture, and we're going to talk about it. Because I feel like as we're talking about building God's kingdom, as we're talking about being used by God, here's what's so incredible. And here's what I know about Pastor Will, Pastor Andrea, Pastor Jason, and this whole team. We all can be used by God. Can I get an amen? Come on, I'm going to say it again. We all can be used by God. Can I get an amen? What's beautiful about church, what's beautiful about what we get to be a part of, you know what these Sundays are? These Sundays are celebrations. These Sundays are rallies for your Monday to Saturday. Can I say it again? I'm going to say it again, all right? I know you're smiling at me in your mind and in your heart. I'm going to say it again. Think about this. These Sundays, they're not just for you to survive the week. But these Sundays are a place to share testimony and celebrate where you're going to be sent back into Monday through Saturday. Christianity is not a spectator sport. Christianity is not that you just sit here and what happens is we hear from our beautiful pastors and we honor them and we love them. But you get to do the work. I get to do the work. There's nothing special about people up here that hold mics. We just said yes to God, and here's what I want to encourage you with, and here's what I want to talk to you about this, about building God's kingdom and being used by God, is because God wants to use you. Amen? This world is crazy. Okay, we ain't going to talk about what's happening, but this world is cray, 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 cray. You know what I'm saying? It's crazy. And what God wants to do is he wants to use us, normal people, to change the world. So if you're taking notes, the title of this message, I put this as the main thing. 
It might already be on the screen. I'm only going to look at the screen once. I'm not going to do it right now because this thing is massive. I want to watch the Laker games in here, uh, but I have to ask Pastor Will. Okay, so the main thing. Here's what I want you to do is I want you to bow your heads and pray with me. Lord, we pray for this morning. We thank you so much for what you're doing. We ask that you would speak to us, Jesus, about the main thing. We ask that you would open up scripture as we read this. Lord, I pray that anything that I share um, that's of me would not bear any fruit, would, would, just, would just die. And anything that's from you would bear fruit, 60, 30, 100 fold. Lord, I thank you for everyone in the room. Lord, and we just say, here we are. Use us in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen, amen and amen. Okay, so we're there. If you're there, think about this. Moses is on the mountain, and Jesus and God. Again, this is going to be the Samuel Rodriguez Pentecostal version of Exodus 32. I'm going to go quick, and I'm going to go 33, okay? Jesus is like, and God, the Father, the Trinity, they're like, yo, I'm destroying these people. Moses is like, don't do it. You know what I'm saying? Don't do it. And he's like, no, I'm going to do it. So he ends up not doing it, and we enter into this story where they're getting ready to go to their promised land, but then here's what God says, and I want you to hear this. And before we read 33, I want you to hear this quote, because when you think about it, you're like, come on, Sammy, I ain't worshiping idols. I don't have that golden calf in my house, you know what I mean? Just saying, shalom, golden calf, you know, you know, doing whatever. No, but I want you to hear this quote. This is by Dwight L. Moody. He said this years and years ago. He said, you don't have to go to heathen lands today to find false gods. America is full of them. Whatever you love more than God is your idol. And here's what I want to do. Can we have some fun? Come on. I want to go after some idols today in our lives, mine included. Can I get an amen? How much of the time have I done that? I'm going to call myself out first. Have I let someone else be the mediator between my relationship with God? Maybe that's a pastor. Maybe that's a mentor. Maybe that's a friend. How much have I allowed money to be an idol in my life? How much have I allowed all these different things? And so what I want you to do is as we think about all of us in this room being used by God, all of us in this room being building the kingdom, I also want us to think through what are the idols that sometimes we could hold above God? Does that make sense? So think, just, just for a second, I'm, I'm going to keep beating this dead horse. I want, I want you to think about this. How much of the time, if you're like me, you read the Bible and you're like, man, Peter, what a doubter, stepped out of the boat and just sank. I mean, I would have just danced on that water. You know what I'm saying? You're like, I would have just, thank you, Jesus, just worshiped God as I was walking on the waves. And then I got to ask you, like, when was the last time you walked on water? You know what I'm saying? Like, like we always give ourselves the benefit of the doubt. I'm always saying, like, man, I would have danced. I would have slid on that water. I would have just said, hey, you know what I'm saying? But what we do is God says, I want you to go across the street and share the love of Jesus with your neighbor. And you're like, I can't, God. I can't. I don't talk. I pray in my mind. You know what I mean? Like, how much of the time do we make excuses, but we give ourselves, and I'm saying for myself, the benefit of the doubt. And so here, let's jump in. Okay, we're jumping in here. Exodus 33, verse 1. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. Here we go. And we're talking about, if you're taking notes, again, you get into heaven faster, the setup. So I want you to write that down, the setup. It should be on the screen. If it's not, it will be in a second. So verse 1, check this out. It says, the Lord said to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, to your offspring, I will give it. I will send an angel before you. Someone say amen. Think about that, an angel going before him. That's pretty dope. You know what I mean? You're like, you're probably requesting, can it be Gabriel, Michael? Come on, send a big dog. You know what I mean? But he said, I'm going to send an angel before you. Keep going. It says, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. All of those ites, you know what I'm saying? They're all getting drawn, dro drove out. Verse 3, go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. I'm like, my goodness, Jesus, God, tell us exactly how you feel. Keep going. Verse 4, when the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments for the Lord had said to Moses, say to the people of Israel, you are a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. So now take off your ornaments so that I might know what to do with you. 
Verse 6, therefore the people of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onward. You're like, I thought this was going to be encouraging. It will be, I promise, okay? We're, we're going to be, you know, we're just going to be the fly on the wall. We'll be the tent in this analogy, okay? We're not the, we're not the people worshiping idols. We can't put ourselves in those shoes of Moses. We're just the tent that the glory comes down on, okay? So the setup, and now here's what I want you to think of. So Moses is in the place right here, and I want you to think of this. What did God tell Moses? Moses said, or God told Moses this. He said, listen, I'll still give you the promise. I'll still have the people go with you. I'll even send an angel before you. But I can't go because if I even take one step with you, I might consume everybody right there. And here's where we enter in, into the method in which Moses redeemed and invited his presence to go with him. So the second part, I want you to write down. So the first part was the setup. The second part is the method. Everyone say the method. Say it like you mean it. Say the method. Look to your neighbor, say the method. Look to your second choice and say, I love you. You know what I mean? It's always awkward. You're like, don't make me talk in church. You turn, even, and then they turn, and you're just like, rejection. It's okay. God heals. Okay, the method. Here we go. Okay, so we have this setup. I want to bring you in. If you're there in the story, they're in the wilderness, right? God has told Moses, I can't go with you. I'll give you that promise, but I can't go with you. And here we see the setup for what Moses is getting ready to ask God on behalf of his people. I don't know if you're with me, if you feel this, but our nation, our people, the world needs a lot more people that can stand in the gap and say, God, we must have you with us. I'm going to say it again. We need a lot more people that says, God, we must have you with us. And if I could convince you of anything, I feel like from today on, what day is it? I'm looking at my phone right now. June 26th. I feel like, could it be that God is inviting you into a place to take greater risks than you've ever taken before. And I'm not just talking to the people that feel like they're gifted. I'm not even just talking. You're like, man, I don't even know if I'm saved. I came in here to watch Top Gun, and I just I can't leave now. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, what's going on? I'm talking to you the first time. Maybe this last week, these last few weeks, you've messed up, and, you, and you're like, no, you don't understand. I'm broken. That's all of us. We're all broken. God wants to change us from the inside out. But I believe in this church, in the beloved church. I believe in who you are, whether you've been here since day one or this is your day one. I believe this is what God wants to speak to you. So in verse 7, here we see the method of Moses, okay? So again, we're going to be taking notes. I want to have you write down four things, but first we're going to read these verses. If you like the Bible, say, I love the Bible. I know you do. Here we go, verse 7. It says, now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp. Everyone say far off. I want you to hear that, okay? So Moses used to take the tent, he used to pitch it. Now, yeah, just, you know, pronounce every word, okay? I'm not saying any bad words, you know what I mean? Outside the camp, far off from the camp. Just remember that. And he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out of the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up and each would stand at his tent door. And watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent. The pillar of cloud would stand at the, at the entrance of the tent. And the Lord would speak with Moses. Someone say, amen. Think about that for a second. I, I, like we read these scriptures and we're like, get used to it. He would go to a tent. A glory cloud would fall on it, and God would speak to him face to face. Listen, this is crazy. Verse 10, and when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent. How does the cloud stand? I don't know, but for another time. All the people would rise up and worship, each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face. Everyone say face to face. As a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp... His assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Here's what I want you to write down in this method. I want you to write down these four things, and then we're going to go through each of them. Okay, so the first one, it should be on the screen, that Moses initiated time with God. Moses made his tent, the tent of meeting. It was outside the city, so he had to separate. And when Moses worshipped, they all worshipped. I'm going to say it again, and then we're going to just touch on it, and then we're going to go into the meat of it. So Moses initiated time with God, write that down, made his tent the tent of meeting, was outside the city, had to separate. When Moses worshiped, they all worshiped, he led by example. 
And here's what I love. I love this because Moses knows exactly what's been happening. Moses knows that God is getting ready to send him out without his presence. And so what does Moses do? He goes in to where he meets God face to face. The first thing that we wrote down is that he had to go far off. He initiated time with God. He didn't just set up his tent next to his home. And and what I feel challenged by myself, and I hope you feel challenged by as well, is that sometimes we say, God, I want to be used by you, but we don't want to initiate time with God that's out of our comfort zone. Can I say that again? We say, God, I want to be used by you, but we don't initiate with God out of our comfort zone. What stuck out to me in the scripture was that Moses, the tent of meeting, was far away from everything else. And if I could challenge you with something, if I could invite you into something, I feel like God is inviting us to be far away from what we're used to and far away from what's comfortable to us. I love that detail because it says that he would have to walk out. Hopefully it doesn't feed back. He would have to walk. It might feed back, and if it does, that's okay. He would have to walk a far way away. Yeah, it does feed back. Think about that. Imagine this. Imagine this. Imagine, like, like we think, oh, I don't have a lot of comforts. If I was like, hey, guys, church has been changed. We're actually going from now till 12 a.m. You guys cool with that? No bathroom breaks? You're like, excuse me, I'm leaving. You know what I mean? It's just funny when we touch on certain time things. It can make us manifest these areas. But what Moses did was he initiated a place with God that was far away. Everyone say far away. And here's what's so beautiful. He made his tent the tent of meeting. He said, God, I want you to dwell in my tent. God, I want you to, I want to meet with you. I want my time, my place, my space to be a place where I meet with God alone. So not only does he go far away, right? Not only did he initiate time with God, he made his tent, the tent of meeting. It was outside the city, so he had to separate. Like I said before, he separated himself from the status quo. He separated himself from what it was used to. And here's what's so beautiful. When Moses worshiped, they all worshiped. Come on, when Moses worshiped, they all worshiped. When he started walking, they left their tent and they came out and they stood up. Remember, they're at a place where they're thinking, oh my gosh, I've worshiped idols. I've done all these different things. We're talking about the main thing. We're talking about building God's kingdom. We're talking about being used by God. And if, again, if I could convince you of anything, you need to know that we can all be used by God. It's not just for a few of us. It's not just for a few special people, but we could all be used by God. So Moses goes... He stands at the tent. Everyone's worshiping. That's the method, and that's the setup for this story. Now we get into the meat of it. Now we get into the main thing, and now we get into Moses being so bold to ask God some wild, crazy questions. I want to encourage you that we have access to the Father through Jesus. Amen? And we have the ability to ask bold, crazy questions to God. Where we get to say, God, I know my generation is like that. I know my city is like this. I know my family is like this. I know fill in the blank. But God, I ask, would you send mercy? Would you do this? And through our prayers, through our worship, things could shift. What I'm doing here even this morning is I want to convince you of the power and the authority of your relationship with God. Here's what I want you to do for a second. We're going we're we're to finish off this moment. We're going to have the band up in a second, but I want you to close your eyes for a second. I want you to close your eyes. Don't fall asleep because these chairs are comfy, okay? But close your eyes. I want you to think about this. No one looking around. I want you to think about this. Imagine if you had all of heaven backing you. Think about that just for a second. Imagine if all of the power of God was behind every decision you made. Every time you reach, God says, I would answer that calling. I would answer that prayer. Imagine that. Imagine that we are ambassadors for God. We're ambassadors for what he's called to. When we think about building his kingdom, when we think about being used by God, it's not just a fun phrase, but it's behind you. Now, with your eyes closed, as you're pondering that, as you're thinking about limitless power, as you're thinking about a limitless God that wants to encounter everyone around you, how would that change the way you live? How would that change our pains and our brokenness and our insecurities? I think what we're doing, even as we're sharing God's kingdom, I think Pastor Jason shared this, I think he was last week, is that, you know, the kingdom of God, many times we come into salvation and we, we kind of pitch our tent, we set up our tent right by the door of salvation instead of exploring the entire kingdom. I feel like what God wants to bring you into is invite you into the greatest journey that is scary, 
that is confronts all your comforts, but is the greatest reward you could have. Everyone open their eyes, open their eyes. We're going to finish off here. But in verse 12, here's, here's where I want to invite you into. In verse 12, Moses said this. Check this out. Verse 12, Moses said to the Lord. Now, again, the people of Israel are not going into the promised land with the presence of God. And in verse 12, Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know who you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name. And you have also found favor, and, and, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, this Moses talking to God, he's pretty bold. I mean, it's crazy. He says, now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. Everyone say, your people. Come on, say it like you mean it. Come on, I heard you loud before. Say, your people. Moses says, this nation is your people, verse 14. And God said to him, check this out, it's so fun. So, so Moses goes, listen, have, I, have, have you not told me, spoken face to face with me that I found favor in your sight? If that's the case, don't send me up somewhere with this people. You don't even, I don't even know what angel you're sending me. Haven't you said I found favor? And then here's how God responds to his boldness. In verse 14, and he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. In verse 15, and he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, that so that we are different, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? Just a few more verses, and we're going to dive into and finish. Verse 17, and the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do for you, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Okay, we're going to skip, and then we'll read that verse afterwards. So I want you to write down these four things. The first one is this. So write this down. The first one is the people. I want you to write that down. Everyone say it two, on three. One, two, three. Say the people. So here's what's so crazy. I want you to write down next to the people. It's on the screen. I want you to write down fear of man. I want you to write down fear of man next to the people. Can we be honest? I, I'm going to raise both hands, legs. If you've ever dealt with the fear of man, wondering what someone else is thinking about you, can you just lift your hand just so I know that I'm not alone? Can you lift your hand? Lift it up. Lift it up high. Come on. Don't be afraid. Now, here's what I want to do. Keep your hand up. Keep, no, no, no. Keep it up. It's okay. It's okay. Look around for a second. Look around for a second. That's almost all of us. If your hand's not up, you're lying, and I'm going to pray for you, okay? So, you know what I'm saying? So put it back down. We've all dealt with that. We've all had times where we're wondering, man, what is someone else thinking of me or, or what's happening? You want to jump on? Can we get a band up? We're going to just get on the keys. What, what's happening with me and, and, and what's going on? We've all had that, but I want you to hear this. He, Moses led the people wildly, but he feared God more than he feared the, for the, feared the people he was leading. I want you to ask yourself this question. Do you, and I'm asking myself this as well, do I fear God or do I fear people? Do I fear God or do I fear people? They say, again, ask scholars, ask, you know, Jason and Will, some of the smarter people than me. They say, they say up to millions of people were being led out of Egypt, and they were in the wilderness. We can bring it down just a little bit, but I like that. You feel the Holy Spirit now? You're like, ooh. Aaron, Moses' right-hand dude, was the one who made the golden calf. It's crazy. We don't have time to talk about that. Moses could have easily said, okay, you know, your presence isn't going with me, but at least I get to lead these people, and at least I get the promise, and I get an angel. That's dope. But what did Moses do? He said, no, I don't, I don't care if I get the honor to lead your people. I don't care that they wanted to worship idols. He stood in the gap, and he said, I, I'm not even leaving. He wouldn't even leave the wilderness because he feared God more than he feared man. He said, okay, an angel, that's great, but isn't it you going with us makes us distinct, makes us different? When the people are here, essentially what he said, he said, would it be that you brought all of us out to kill us in the wilderness? He goes, no, nah, not on my watch. I, I love these people, but I fear you, God. The first thing I want you to ask yourself is this, do you fear God or fear people? So then the second thing, right, the second thing, as it's up on the screen, I want you to write down the promise. 
And next to the promise, I want you to write down, good, but is it God? Question mark. Okay? Next to the promise, I want you to write down, good, but is it God? Question mark. I think sometimes, sometimes when we're up here um, in Christian contexts, even in preaching, and people with mics, sometimes we're a lot less honest, right, than we should be. And the truth is, how many times have I done this? How many times have you, how many times have we done this where we've taken the promise or a promise God gave us over his presence? Here's what's so crazy. Moses still could have been the leader of a people that, that everyone was afraid of. God even said, I'm still going to drive out all these people. I'm still going to drive them out. And I'll give you your promise. I just won't be with you. How, how many times, how many seasons, how many groups have taken the promise, have taken the people, but the presence isn't anywhere around them? Yeah, the promise is good, but without God, what's the promise? I want you to think about this. You know, when God gives you a promise, it will be by his timing and not yours. Isn't it so great? Sometimes, not really, but the timing of God. I like this. I think I said this before, but 2020, you know. Right in the beginning, everyone was like, vision, 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 your vision, 2020, clarity, all the prophetic conferences. We're going, we're running, we're running, pause. You know what I mean? Like global pandemic still happening, praying for, you know, Will and Andre and the, and the fam to, to get better. It's crazy how sometimes we just get the timing wrong. Can I get an amen for something like that? I don't know if you're like me where we say, this is the year, and the timing's off. This is the time, and the timing's off. When God gives you a promise it will, by, it will be by his timing and not yours. And I want to ask this question together, myself included. Do we love God according to his blessing or do we live, love God himself? I'm going to say it again. Do we love God according to just his blessing of us or do we love God himself? Really think about this. And I'm thinking about it as well. Your craziest dream that you feel like God spoke to you. If God said, hey, I'm going to give it to you. I'm even going to send my best angel on the job, but I can't go with you because there's too much idolatry in your heart. Man, many times we've settled for that. And when we truly think about building God's kingdom, when we truly think about being used by God, when we truly think about the main thing, which I'm going to hit on this next point, is that it has to be presence over everything. And I want you to write that down, presence over everything. Because the next point, I wish we had time to go into this, but we don't. But the truth is, and I'll just, I'll throw this at you. And then, you know, and the second point is, when we interpret what Jesus meant for our promise, that is the moment we create an Ishmael for ourselves. I don't know if you, God's giving you a promise and you're like, all right, God, when you said that, the timing of it, I got that, you know what I mean? And then we try and do it, and we create an Ishmael like Abraham. Abraham had the word, you're gonna have a son, and then it didn't happen in his timing. So Abraham and Sarah was like, see, you know, when God said that, what he really meant was this, and they created Ishmael, and all that pain is because of, they took it out of God's timing, the promise out of God's timing. Question for you, for, for myself, is what is your promise, and are you trusting his timing? So we see this conversation going on, going on, going on. And then we see this third point, which is the presence. And next to it, the main thing, the title of my message. And what's beautiful about this is that when Moses asked Jesus, <clears throat> Moses goes, why would we go to a promise? Why would we get a land if you're not with me. And then God speaks to Moses and he says, I, I will go with you. I will go. Yahweh will go with you. Think about that convert. I will go with you. I will give you what? Rest. And I want you to think about this. Where was God leading the people of Israel into? He, he was leading them into a battle. 
And here's what's so funny sometimes, that I do it, that we all do it. In the wilderness, it said that there was a cloud by day, which there was, you know, shade, so no one got burnt. Amen. There was fire by night. It was warm. Praise the Lord. They could wear their tank tops and flip-flops, maybe. I don't know. Moving on. It says manna would fall every day. Even some quail, because they're like, come on, Jesus. We need some meat. You know what I'm saying? So manna, quail on Sundays. Thank you, Lord. Maybe Saturdays, Shabbat. It says their shoes never wore out. Their clothes never wore out. But you know what's crazy? The moment they crossed the Jordan into their promise, the cloud by day left, the fire by night left, the manna stopped coming, the quail stopped coming, and their clothes wore out. And they had to beat their plows into spears, and they had to create swords. They had to fight. And some of us, this word's for you. You've been being obedient to the Lord and the warfare or the intensity has increased and you feel like that's a sign you're going the wrong way. I want to encourage you, you're going the right way. The closer you get to the promise, the more you're going to have to fight. I'm going to say it again. The closer you get to the promise, the more you're going to have to fight. And so Moses knew, I know we're going to have to fight and I don't care about any promise or any land if we don't have the presence, if we don't have you, Jesus. You could give me everything, but if we don't have you, I got nothing. And the truth is, in many places here in America, we would rather have the promise. Not even the promise, we'd rather have people than his presence. And what beloved is, what this church is, what you are, when we think about building God's kingdom, when we think about being used by God, We are a people that says, I will stay in the wilderness if it means your presence stays here. I ain't leaving one bit. I'm staying where you're at. If you're going to the promised land, I'm going there. If you're staying in the wilderness, I'm staying there because it's you over everything. When God said they're giving them rest, Rest is not ease. Someone needs to hear that. Rest is not a life without problems. You know, it's funny. It's like if Christianity, what's, what's, what is promised with Christianity is that we'll all suffer persecution. That's like actually in the Bible. We don't like to preach that, but that's true. Moving on from that, but not really. Check this out. If Christianity was like Santa Claus, you know, come to Santa, be good and not naughty. You get presents. That's awesome. We all have our version sometimes of the Jesus we want to follow. But when he says, my presence will give you and I'll give you rest, rest is not a life without problems. I'd encourage you as you leave here, and they'll probably do a series on it, but Sermon on the Mount, the manifesto of Jesus, his main sermon, Matthew 5 through 7, at the very end, he says, anyone who does my words, like listens to them and applies them, will be like the people that built their house on a rock. And if you hear my words and don't apply them and live it out, you build your house on the sand. But here's the crazy thing. Wherever you build your house, in Matthew 7, it says a storm comes. It doesn't say storms might come, right? It says when the storm comes, if you built it on the rock, your house will stand. If you built it on the sand, it will wash away. What I love about this when he says my presence will go with you, Sometimes the the best place to be is in the middle of a fight because his presence is right there. And I want to encourage some of you guys here. You walked in. You feel discouraged. You have family members, friends, your workplace, whatever it is. And you're like, God, I want to be used by you, God. But it's been so crazy. I want to tell you, you're in the right place. You're in the right place. Because in Psalms 23, it says that when you're surrounded by enemies, he prepares a table before you in the presence of your enemies. Okay, we're almost done, I promise you. I'm gonna let you go. I want you to ask yourself this question in the presence, in the main thing. Is your definition of rest and God's definition different? Because many times it is. So here we go, Exodus 33. God says, I will give you my presence. I'm going with you. And you would think Moses would be stoked. Yes, God, we going. Going back to Aaron. Aaron, I told you. Shouldn't have done that for another time. But he gets even more bold and he asks this question as we're ending. Check this out. 
It says, the Lord said in verse 17, the Lord said to Moses, the very thing that I have spoken to you, I will do for it. You have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. We already read that out. And in verse 18, Moses said this, please show me your glory. Okay, so there's a difference between the presence and the glory. You hear that? There's a difference between being in his presence and seeing his glory. The, the, the Hebrew word, the word used for glory is kavod, kavod. For all the scholars, correct me afterwards, it's fine. But it's the weighty, the weighty presence of the glory of God. Moses goes, ask even further. He knows he can't see it all. Because in the Bible it says no one can see God and live. But he goes, God, show me your glory. I want to see it, God. I want to know it. I want to encounter it, God. Please show me your glory. Verse 19, and he said, and I will make, this is what's so amazing. I will make all, this is God speaking. I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord, Yahweh. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see my face and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by where you shall stand on the rock. And when my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand. My, this is crazy. Until I have passed by, then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face you shall not be seen. Even his back, he saw his back and his, his face shown for the rest of his life. Isn't that crazy? Think about this. And you, we don't have time to look at it, but in, 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 in Exodus 34, 29, all the way through, it says when he came down from the mountain, when he, when he sees his glory, his back, it says that his face would shine. The people would get so afraid that after he would talk to them, he would have to put a veil on. Moses talks to God and says, God, send your presence. I don't want the promise. I don't want the people. I just want your presence. God says, I'll give it all to you. And then he goes even further. He goes, show me your glory, God. And what does God say? When we ask to see his glory, God says, I want, I'm going to show you my goodness. There's a link between God's glory, the weight of his glory, that manifest presence of his glory and his goodness. And it speaks of it there, and we don't have time to go into it. But as we think about the glory, that fourth point, the weight of his glory, the goodness, here's where we're going to end. Here's where we're going to end. In 2 Corinthians, okay, 3, 7 and 8, or 3, 17 and 18. I want you to hear this. I want you to just lean forward just for a second. Just lean forward. Just actually let me see you lean forward, and you can lean right back. Everyone lean forward. Oh, there we go, everyone. There you go. Okay, lean back. You're like, whew, my exercise is done for the day. Think about this. Think about this. You're telling me that Moses would speak to God in, the t in his tent face to face, and then physically he couldn't see his face but he saw his back he was hidden in the cleft he saw his goodness everything went before him and it says it was so crazy that encounter that his face would be so bright that he would have to put a veil on because people were afraid to talk to him my gosh if I could ever have that then I would be so bold to tell my friends man if I had that then I would be so bold to I want you to hear this this is for all of us. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. If it's not up there, that's okay. I can read it out. I'm going to go back to verse 12. We read a lot of the Bible, but it's okay. It says this. It says, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Everyone say very bold. Not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened, for to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ it is taken away. Verse 15, we're almost there. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom. Everyone say freedom. 
And here's where I want you to capture this. Come on. I want everyone to listen. We're going to stand. We're going to stand as I read this out. Come on. We're going to stand. I want you to stand up. Come on. Stand with me. I've been sitting standing. That's okay. Verse 18 is where we're getting excited. We're going to worship two calls. I'm going to get Pastor Jason up. We're going to be done. I'm Latino then. Remember, I have like 18 closes. But it's okay. Verse 18. Here we go. And we all with unveiled faces. Somebody say unveiled. Say it like you mean to say unveiled. It says with unveiled faces, we behold the glory of the Lord. We in this room are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another for this comes from the Lord who is spirit. I want to encourage you. The glory that Moses encountered, that crazy story that I just shared has nothing to compare with the glory that we have right now. I want you to think about this. I want you to hear this in the Old Testament. In the Holy of Holies, in in the tabernacle, only one guy, the high priest, could go into that holy place once a year. And if he had any sin in his life, he would drop dead in the presence of that glory. They would actually tie a bell and a rope around his leg so that when he was going into the Holy of Holies, if that thing was still moving, he was okay. But if he wasn't, they would pull him out and they would get a new high priest. Now, that's a scary job. Amen? But here's what's so crazy. When Jesus died on the cross, when he rose from the grave, my friend has this line. He says it. He said to me years ago, and I always remembered it. He says, the presence, the glory that killed the priest in the Old Testament is the air we breathe. Think about that. How much of the time are we taking for granted the access to the glory that we have. Maybe, just maybe, as we think about the end of this time and the end of this message, the end of this series, and like Pastor Jason said, the kingdom is every message we preach here at this church and every church. This is like a starter series that's launching. As we think of the main thing, as we think of his presence, as we think of his glory, as we think about building the kingdom and being used by God, can I encourage you and myself to be like Moses, to be so bold that says, God, even if I get to lead people, and even if I get every promise I've been asking for, I will not go anywhere without your presence and without your glory. If I can encourage you with anything, I believe that the enemy so much, so many of the times, he plays tricks on our mind, telling us that we don't have access to a power we have access to. It's like we have to pay all this debt And God is saying, you got millions and billions and trillions of dollars in the account. If you had that, we'd be dancing. We'd be like, lunch on me, let's go. That's what we have in the power of the kingdom. That's what we have in the glory of God. Any problem that you're facing, I'm not saying that it's not real. But when you hold it up to the glory of God, you realize, whoa, my problems are real. But I've made a mountain out of this molehill because I have this glory in my life. Here's what I want you to do. I want everyone to close your eyes and lift your hands. And I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to give it to Jason. I'm going to give two calls. I'm going to pray for you. But I want you to say this. I want you to say, Jesus. Say this. Say, Jesus. Say, Jesus. We're just bringing it down. Just keys. Just keys for a second. Say, Jesus. I'm sorry for being led by the fear of man. Say this with me, say, Jesus, I'm sorry that I've allowed promises to be a higher priority over your presence. Say, Jesus, I long for your presence. And I want you to bring your hands down a place of receiving like this, opened up, eyes closed. And I want you to say, 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 God, show me your glory. Come on, say, show me your glory. Here's what I want to do. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna worship in a second. We're going to do the second part. But before we do, as your hands are open like this, heads bowed. In every place I preach, I always love to give an opportunity for you to surrender your life to Jesus. Maybe you walked in here and you're like, man, that it was awesome, but I I don't even know what the presence means. I don't even know what this means and that means. And you're like, I love people, but I've never even encountered, I've never even made a decision 
to surrender my life fully to Jesus. And there's two groups of people in the room that walked in sometimes. One, you hadn't made that decision before, and then you went away. What we like to call a prodigal son, prodigal daughter moment. We'll get the lights on a little bit more. Heads bowed, eyes closed. And this morning, you feel a stirring in your heart to come back. If that's you and you need to make that final decision, maybe you've done this many times, but you're like, I got to get right back with God and surrender everything and say yes to his presence in my life. In a second, on the count of three, I want you to shoot your hand up. Or maybe you've come in this room and you've never even surrendered your life to Jesus. You've always lived for yourself. Now's the moment to say yes to Jesus. Always love to give an opportunity, even if there's one, two, three, whoever's in the room. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to bow your heads, close your eyes. Lord, we thank you so much that it says your kindness draws us all to repentance. And Lord, I pray right now that anyone that needs to make that decision for the first time or for the last time to say yes to you fully, when we count to three, that they would say yes. We love to say this line, circuit riders. We say Jesus is either Lord of all or not Lord at all. Jesus isn't just like a side thing. He's everything. So if that's you, no one looking around, all heads bowed, eyes closed. If that's you on the count of three. One, Jesus loves you so much. Two, this is the greatest decision you can make. Three, if that's you, just lift up your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for responding. Thank you. You can put your hand back down. Anyone else, if you lift your hand, don't lift it again. But if that's you, you want to recommit or you want to commit for the first time on the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. If that's you, you can lift your hand up. Just slip it right back down. Amen. Can we pray this together as a family? Say, Jesus. Say it like you mean it. Say, Jesus, we thank you for dying on the cross. Come on, all together, all together. For dying on the cross, for rising from the grave. And we confess, Jesus, that we're sinners, that we need a savior. We ask for your forgiveness. Thank you for cleansing me. Thank you for forgiving me. And Jesus, I give you my yes to be my Lord and to be my savior from this day on. And Holy Spirit, come and fill me up in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Come on, can we make some noise for everyone who just responded there? We're, we're, we're going to end. Again, I told you I'm Latino. I know we're going to go get the kids. You're usually out for, for a, a while. Can, can I get two, three more minutes? Of course I can. I got the mic. Here's what I want to do. I want to invite you if you can. Can you kneel down? Can you kneel down? If you can't, you can sit on your seat. I want, I, but I want you to kneel down. You could get around. And, and here's what we're going to ask. We're going to ask for the Lord. If you want to lay down, you could lay down too. We're going to ask for God to move in power. Come on. I'm just going to lay right here. We're going to sing it out. Come on, here we go. I pray right now, God, would you meet us in a real way? Lord, we're desperate for your presence and we're desperate for your glory. Lord, I pray for this church, Lord, this beloved church. I pray right now as we worship, Lord, the things that are bothering us, Lord, that they would fade away and that your glory, the weight of your glory would fall. Lord, in Jesus' name right now, I pray for healings. I pray for miracles. I pray for people who are sick would be healed. Lord, I pray that you would move in power. Lord, would you show us your glory? Come on, let's sing that out. Let's just sing that out. Let's sing out. Show us your glory. Let it go forth from here to the nations. Let your presence rest in this place as we gather to seek your face. Let your glory fall in this room. Let it go. From here to the nations, let your praise rest in this place as we gather to seek your face. 
Here's what we're going to do. Just one more minute. I'm going to give it to Pastor Jason. I just want you to stay there. No one moving around. As the music stops, we're just going to stop music for a second. You turn the pad off, everything. We're just going to go quiet. Right now, God, we just pray for a fresh weight of your glory upon us, God, for everyone here in the room. But as we leave and get back to our schedule and, and what we're going to be doing and having lunch and getting back into the week, God, we pray that we would carry your glory everywhere we go. Lord, I pray right now, would your glory be so real? Here's why I wanted to stop this. For a second as your heads bowed eyes closed we might not always have the opportunity to be in a worship setting like this every sunday we even saw that in covid where everything was shut down but we could always do this we could get in our room in our closet wherever we could say god show me your glory lord i pray would you continue to use this beautiful church the beloved church pastor will pastor andrea Pastor Jason, the whole team. And Lord, even as we go into house of prayer and prioritizing presence and everything happening, God, I pray for all of us in this room, would you demonstrate your glory? Lord, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hey, I love you guys. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Pastor Jason. Come on, you guys put your hands together for our boy, Sammy Rodriguez. You fam, bro. You already know Will Andrea. We love you. And uh, when you move back out to Southern California, bro, you know where you come in. Hey, one more time. You guys put your hands together for our boy. Uh, to be honest with you, we threw him in. We threw him in, and uh, he literally landed yesterday, had a wedding, and uh, he, he, he came through for us. So we appreciate you, bro. Uh, thank you again. Hey, we, we love you guys here at Beloved Church, and we are excited next month as we jump into a new series about the house of prayer. We're excited. So it was the perfect segue today, Sammy. Uh, we're going to let you guys go. Um, if you do have uh, children, if you can go to the pre-K or the next-gen room, uh, the volunteers would greatly appreciate it. But I know that's a little bit of a smaller amount today as well. But I want to leave you guys with this. Um, I actually got a screenshot Somebody, some brave soul, has a large popcorn up at the top. I saw that. Jonathan Kim, I think you were the first one to do it. Uh, I just want to say this. We, uh, after this service, everyone's going to go to lunch, and I want to be able to invite all of you. Uh, we're all going to congregate out there. Someone's going to announce it. Uh, we'll go to lunch immediately after this. But I want to say this. If you, this is the one announcement right here. Uh, I started something a while back. Some of the members of the church thought, Jason, what if we started a group chat that we can begin to get all the people in our church that don't normally hang out.